Yeah. We have got a very, very special guest in the studio today. David Dean, the former vice chairman of Arsenal Football Club. I said, it's Arsene Wenger. And Ray Parler said, who the f is that? Can you give me a story about the Invincibles? And he said, yes, Mr. Dean. Here's a story I can tell you. Hi, and welcome along to AFTV. We have got a very, very special guest in the studio today. I'm honoured, and I really mean that. I am honoured to have David Dean, the former vice chairman of Arsenal Football Club. And that's, you know what, we'll get into that later because vice chairman, you, you, as far as every Arsenal fan is concerned, you run the shop. You run the shop, right? I know, and by reading your book, I know that you, you're a very um, humble person, but you run the shop. But listen, um, we're here to talk about David's book. It's called Calling the Shots by David Dean, How to Win in Football and Life. I've got to say, right, um, I've read the book. I listened, well, I, I listened to it, the audio book. And I have to say, David, right, straight away, before we even get into it, this was brilliant. Thank I am you. ready, even before we're starting to get into this, recommending this to everybody out there, particularly if you're an Arsenal fan. But even if you're not an Arsenal fan, if you're a football fan, this book is brilliant. The amount of things that David Dean has done for football in this country is unbelievable. And we're going to get into that. So thank you. This is brilliant, David. Very kind of you to say that, Robbie. And it's an honour to have you here. And um, Great pleasure. there's so much, right? I don't even know where to start. But let, let's let's start um, right from the beginning and talk a little bit, because you, you sort of talk about that in the book, and talk a little bit about you. The first thing I learned in this book, um, as um, uh, a guy whose uh, parents are from Jamaica, is that probably in the early days of my life, um, the food that I was eating that was being imported from countries like Jamaica had a lot to do with David Dean. <laughs> That's true. How comes? Tell us that. Well, my late mother had a shop in Shepherd's Bush Market, and it was around about the 1950s, and it was the time really of the Windrush generation. And she realized that a lot of her customers coming into the shop were from the West Indies and West Africa, and they were all asking her about their food. And she had the business sense, the entrepreneurial flair, to go out to the West Indies and West Africa and start importing. So the next thing is, before long, it became the place to go where everybody could buy yams and sweet potatoes and not grown green bananas, plantains, callaloo, right, breadfruit, mangoes. And, and that's a, that, that was my introduction. When I went to the shop, I could see what was going on. And really soon afterwards, um, my brother and I started a wholesale business because the demand was so great. And that really developed really well. Mm. So we were supplying people all around England with, that, with their, their products coming from the West Indies and West Africa. And after that, we actually built a plant in Jamaica making ackies, canning ackies, believe wow. it or not. Wow. Yeah, in Red Hills Road, Kingston, Jamaica. Wow. So the ackee and sawfish that I was a eating had something rice to do and with you. Saltfish nice and when did you make uh, I'm <laughs> But I'm sad to say I'm on my way. I won't be back for many a day. My heart <laughs> is it. down, my head is going around. I left my little girl in Kingston town. That's it. There you the go, song. Robert. It's a song free of charge. <laughs> but listen, um the the first thing I picked up as well in this book as well, that you're you're you you wasn't born into a rich family. No, you're you're self-made. You, you, you know, I mean, uh, we, we I always look at you and think, you know, and anybody who's at the top level of football, you think, oh, billionaire, millionaire, rich. But you, by reading this book, I see that you're, you're a person, you're a real entrepreneur and, you know, you're self-made. And that's how you was able to get into Arsenal. Yeah, my, uh, my father, my late father was a tobacconist. He was a manager of a shop in Leicester Square. And my mother started a small shop in Shepherd's Bush. And because of her entrepreneurial flair, really developed that business of importing food, and uh, which my brother and I then took over. And then I went into the sugar business, where I spent many years. Uh, and then I bought one chair in Arsenal. And that's how mm. it happened. How did you get into Arsenal? How did you first 
it's, Go, you it's know, your lovely, first it's, gig. It's a lovely story, and of course, it's well chronicled in the book. Yeah. Uh, that um, I managed to buy one single share, which really wasn't worth anything, but it had the certificate which I framed above my bed. But it also gave me the opportunity of getting the company's accounts. So every year I could see how they were doing. And I noticed by chance there were 15% of the shares unissued. So I had the temerity to write a handwritten letter to the board saying I'd like to subscribe for those unissued shares. I had no idea what they were worth. And then I really stuck my neck out. And I, I used this motto, which I tell kids in schools and in people in prisons as well. That my motto is the motto of the turtle. You don't get anywhere unless you stick your neck out. Yes, you said that many so, times in the book. So I stuck my neck out and I sent a blank check with my letter. I thought, what are they going to do? Well, they're not going to run away with my money. But I knew that would give them, uh, uh, they'd have to reply to me, which they did. And then I had an interview and I remember seeing Ken Fryer. He took me for lunch and he virtually, uh, he was doing a DNA on me. He wanted to check me out and making sure I was okay. Yeah, and, and you say in the book that like, Literally, when they sold you the shares, they were sort of like, you know what, this guy must be crazy or something, you know, because I mean? it's going to be dead money. Well, the, the late chairman, Peter Wood, said it was dead money. And it mm. was in those days, in the 1980s, don't forget, we, these were the days of hooliganism. You were talking just before. Mm. Women were not going to the games. Mothers didn't want their children to go to the games. Uh, the facilities were not very good. The game itself was just from 3 o'clock to 20 to 5. There was no big screens. There was no entertainment. Very, very little facilities within the stadium. Uh, so it wasn't fashionable. And in fact, the tendencies were dropping like a stone, yeah. which we can talk about later, why we formed the Premier League. Mm. And of course, then, you know, you, you, you're involved in the club and you start to get a growing influence in the club and growing influence. And they start to put you into a position where, you know, you're able to make decisions. Well, I joined the club in 19, went on the board in 1983 and was made vice chairman. In fact, Peter Hillwood, the chairman, said, would I like to take the chair? And I thought, you know, the club is so steeped in tradition that actually uh, I didn't take the chair at the time. But he was very good. He let me have my head. He let me virtually run it, which I enjoyed. I liked that responsibility. I'm not a good backseat driver. So, <laughs> which you say again, you yeah, say that a lot in the book. Yeah, wrong. which is true. Yeah. And, you know, I, I wanted to, I could see there was an opportunity there. And, you know, being the club I loved. And uh, I have to show you this. Can we talk about my, uh, my diary? For Your one diary, one? which you describe a lot in the, in the book. So I don't know whether you can see this. Uh, wow. That's, that's that, the actual diary you speak this is, and, 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 I, and I loan this out to museums and exhibitions from time What years on that? This is 1958. Jeez. So this is, and, and my writing was so neat in those days. That is so, very neat. How did you fit that all in? It's so see, small. <laughs> there you go. And I'll just read one. I don't know whether you can see that. So this is February the 1st, 1958. Arsenal 4, Manchester United 5. Woke up at 11, had breakfast at 1, uncle and I had lunch and went to the Arsenal. It was always the Arsenal, went to the Arsenal. Greatest game I've ever seen. It was great. Arsenal were 3-0 down at half time, and then goals by Bloomfield 2 and Heard 1 rallied them to 3. Rallied, even though that was a good word. <laughs> rallied them to 3 all. But Manchester United went ahead 5-3 and then 10 minutes from time, Tapscott scored to make it 4-5. What a game. All of the Arsenal team played well, except for Kelsey. He was the <laughs> goalkeeper. Now we're middle of the league. Wow. And then a week or two later, tragically in red ink, is written, Manchester United in air disaster when on the way back from a European game. Manchester United's airliner crashed coming back from Belgrade. Seven first 11 players killed, others critically injured. The plane crashed at Munich airport. Byrne, Coleman, Taylor, Pegg, Whelan, Jones and Bent all dead. Matt Busby, the manager, on the danger list. The team was worth £250,000. It's shocking, just terrible. The worst I've ever known in soccer. So I guess that just shows you what football mm. overall, not just Arsenal, meant to me. And virtually every entry is about about Arsenal and going. You still there. keep those diaries to this no, day? No, no. It was when I was in my mm. early early teens. I was about thirteen or fourteen mm. here writing this. So you you started to have a growing influence at um, Arsenal, and part of having a growing influence um, is to make really tough decisions. 
And one of your early tough decisions was to relieve Terry Neal of his duties as a manager. Um, how hard was that? Oh, it's never easy to, to release a manager um, because, you know, you're, you get to know them very well. You have to know their families. But it's something you have to do in the best interest of the club. And at the time just after I joined the board in 83, 1983, the club was struggling a bit in the league. Then we had a game against Warsaw, who were in the third division at the time in the League Cup, and we lost at home. And I'll never forget that because the crowd outside afterwards in Avenal Road started chanting and, uh, and all we could hear, we were in the boardroom, we could hear downstairs, there was a whole rumpus and it was uh, sack the board, sack the board, sack the board. And then somebody yelled out, Dean out, Dean out. <laughs> and I said, give me a chart, I've only just joined, give me a chart. <laughs> but that, that taught me something at the time, you know, obviously ne never underestimate the power of the, f the voice of the fans. Mm. And um, so we had to relieve Terry uh, after that, soon after that of the job. Yep. And Don Howe took over for his interim. Yep, Don Howe took over. And then after Don Howe, it was um, moved on to George Graham. Um, yeah. And George Graham came in and then things started to Stick really become did. More, su uh, more of a success. But however, from reading the book, George Graham wasn't your first choice, was he? That's true. Actually, my first choice was, believe it or not, Sir Alex Ferguson. Yeah, I, 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 was, I, was, I, was, I, I saw that. I was like, Sir Alex Ferguson. I presented that to the board at the time because I'd been, and I always liked to go, go around games around the world, and I used to go to Scotland occasionally, and I used to see Aberdeen play and um, uh, seeing and, and keeping an eye on how Sir Alex was doing. And I have to say, I thought he was a potential. And I presented him to the board. And actually, I think the, the board preferred going for an ex-Arsenal player, although he was used to in the lower divisions because he was at Millwall mm. at the time. And then we chose, and collectively, we always, we always tried to get a unanimous decision on the board. And even though I was outvoted at the time, but nevertheless, I, I quite like the idea of George, I have to say. And I actually thought they could perhaps do a double act together. I thought, well, why not bring in a more experienced guy like Sir Alex with George as his number two? I thought that could be a winning combination. But in the, in the end, we decided, go for George. That was it? so fascinating when I read that. I was like, what if Sir Alex would have come in? Then we wouldn't have had Arson. We wouldn't have had George. You know what I mean? Who knows so, what could happen? Who you know? knows what could happen? But, um, you know, um, George was, was very successful. And then oh, yes. talk about... Um, 89. Talk about 89 yeah, in there, which is such, such a, a historic moment. Yeah, that was just so special. And it, no matter how often football is spoken about and written about, 89 will always be in the memories because literally winning winning the league in the last game of the season, last kick of the season, in fact, was so remarkable. And it mm. was a very special evening. I remember that. The, I think it was the 26th of May, 1989. It was a Friday night. The kickoff was late. I think it was supposed to be 8.05. I think it was delayed a few minutes because of the crowd trying to get in. And, uh, and of course, it was live on ITV in those days. And just watching then Mickey Thomas scored. And, you know, the director's decorum, Robbie, is that you really don't celebrate in the director's box to show respect for the opposition. Well, when Mickey Thomas scored, you know, he's up for grabs now mm. and he beats Grobola with his, with his shot. I couldn't help myself. I just propelled myself six foot in the air. <laughs> going, yes! <laughs> and, Why not? And then when I came down, right back to my seat again. Peter Hillwood, who was the chairman at the time, uh, turned around, used to smoke in those days. He took out his cigar and he said, never in any doubt. <laughs> that was a wonder. He was a master of understatement. So that was that story. Uh, uh, that, that was incredible. And, and there were so many stories. Of course, yeah, so many stories. You, you know what, in, in that period as well, um, obviously that 89, what a high, what an absolute high. There was also a real low in that period as well for football, the the, the disaster at Hillsborough, yeah. which you speak a lot about in the book. And and what again is so fascinating, and what I don't know, if most a lot of people know, but I don't know if they do know that you are one of the main reasons why we have the Premier League now, and that was almost like the tipping point for you, wasn't it? The, the disaster it, it really at Hillsborough, was. when you said to yourself, you, you talk about even how you went to see some of the family the parent, of, yeah. of somebody who was killed, yeah. um, and you just decided there and then that football needs to change. 
Yes, um, and it, it's well chronicled in the book. What happened was I was on the Football League Management Committee. Don't forget, these were the days when before the Premier League. So there were four divisions of 92, making up 92 clubs, professional clubs. And the top division was 22 clubs at the time. And being on the Management Committee, you know, I had to make big de decisions on the future of the game, etc. And then Hillsborough, when that happened in April 89, my daughter came home from school and said, Daddy, you know, two of the girls who perished at Hillsborough went to my school. I said, really? So she managed to get the phone number and I went to, they lived in Hatch End, the parents, Trevor and Jenny Hicks. And I went round to see them. I rang them up first and I said, look, it's David Dean. I'm um, from the Football League Management Committee. Do you mind, can I come and console you? Would you mind me coming round to see you? I'll only spend a few minutes. Mm. Well, we spent the whole evening talking about it, what happened that night at that day at Hillsborough. And the, to this day, it haunts me still mm. when I hear, and I remember so vividly what they were telling me. And Jenny Hicks, who actually came to the launch, I invited her to the launch on last Monday at the Cambridge yeah. Theatre. And once again, she told her story, and it was quite horrific, where she said she... The bodies were lying in the sports hall on perimeter boards wow. with, with blankets over them and they had to identify the victims. So she was telling me how she used to, they would turn over the blankets and hope and pray that it wasn't their child underneath. And very sadly, uh, they found their two children, yeah, their two shocking. daughters. And uh, that, that resonated with me so much and I thought and I said to them at the time when I left them, I said, football has to change. Football cannot be like this. It's a place of entertainment. We have to do something about it. And I think that gave me the inspiration, the strength to try and change football forever. Yeah, and you did change football forever because um, what one of the things that came out of that was the Premier League and you were one of the big drivers in that. And I'm not going to go completely into it. I don't want to spoil the book. That's the thing. It's so good. But, you know, your... your clandestine meetings <laughs> that yeah. you had, um, your, your relationship with Greg Dyke um, at ITV and, 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 and just how you, you wanted to create a Premier League. You wanted to make some drastic changes to how football was, but you met with a lot of resistance because football is that type of sport, isn't it, where nobody likes to change sometimes. Oh, absolutely. In fact, I went to one of my first league management committee meetings and I had the temerity to propose there should be two substitutes instead of one. Believe it or not, there were only one substitute yep, in those, those days, days, right? Now when you think you get five and seven substitutes, yeah. there was only one substitute in those days. And I, uh, I put my hand up and I said, uh, I think there should be two substitutes instead of one. And somebody broke, some said, you can't have that. I said, why not? They said, well, it's an extra bonus. It's an extra meal. It's an extra hotel room. I said, what? <laughs> you know, and that, I, I want to go home and put my head in the microwave oven. I thought, <laughs> come on, you've got to move with the time. We've got to think about it. You know, it's happening in other countries in Europe. We've got to move. And eventually it took about three or four meetings to get that through. When we talk about names on shirts, oh, nobody. I remember putting up, I remember having uh, Adam six and Giggs number 11 and Shearer number nine. And people said, you can't have names on you. I said, why not? He said, it's too much laundry room. Because every <laughs> player's got to have their own short, short sleeve, long sheet, home and away. And, and that's what you had to put it up with. It must have been really frustrating oh. times for you because I can see from just the, in the book, right, that you're a person, you're forward thinking, you're looking, you're also a much travel person. So you look around the world at what other things, other sports are doing. And you're, you're like, oh, you know, that could work in football. But then trying to then persuade your you know, fella um, league managers at the time and it, it league was owners tough was tough, because wasn't it? People don't like change. That's the, the root of the problem. And of course, to try and drive the game forward, we needed change. And forget. these were the days when it was a predominantly male audience. Mm. And, you know, we wanted families. And I could see, because my wife comes from the States, we used to go to America very often. And I could see what happens in American games. Because, you know, they you know how to market their product well. And we didn't. The fact we were well behind. 
and even a 15 minute, I can remember going to one meeting and said, I think we should have a 15 minute half, we only had 10 minute half time in those days. Mm. I think we should have a 15 minute half time. Somebody said, you can't do that. I said, why not? Said, what's the manager going to say for the extra five minutes? I said, what's he going to say? What about the people who want to have a pee and want to have a cup of tea or coffee or a, or a sandwich at half time? <laughs> have another five. And that took about six meetings to get through. And, and conditions in stadiums and that were truly oh, awful in those days. I yeah. remember in my documentary that I did on ITV, I spoke a lot about how, you know, football in those days, you were caged in, you know, the police treated you like, you know, because of the hooliganism in a lot of the cases, the true police treated you like animals. The, it's true. You, it, it, was, it was awful going to, to, to football. I mean, the atmosphere was great, but, you know, I remember even when I used to be at Highbury, and I used to be sat, you know, stood, sorry, at the back of um, the North Bank. When they'd be attacking down the, the clock, and I used to have to lean my head down just to be able to see the other end. I mean, it's changed so much with the, yeah. the stadiums. Well, and like the, you said, you know, there's toilets now for everyone to go to that are not... The, the all-seater stadium did change the face mm. of football for the better. There's and a lot no of that came out of Hillsborough. And that came really out of a lot of... Yes, it was from Hillsborough. Mm. And, and you spearheaded a lot of that change. Well, you know, it was important, but um, forming the Premier League, I was fortunate because I had another four companions with me. I took um, Irving Scholar of Spurs, and I know Arsenal fans may be surprised to hear this, but our closest allies at meetings were always Spurs. And the mm. reason is at board level. Why? Because we shared gatemen, we shared police, we shared caterers. We shared program sellers in those days. Mm. Who, right? They, one week they'd be at Arsenal, next week they'd be at Spurs. So we always had a very good relationship at board level. And I remember Irving Scholar, he was very close. We, you know, we, th we thought similarly. We came from similar mm. backgrounds. And uh, Irving and I, we got on well. Martin Edwards at Manchester United, he was fantastic. He, he mm. was great. Then we had Noel White at Liverpool and then Sir Philip Carter at Everton. So they were the four other conspirators really with me. <laughs> 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 and sadly, two of them, Noel White and Sir Philip Carter, are no longer with us, sadly. So there's only three, mm. three remaining of us who formed the Premier League. And when you see the Premier League today and the product that has become worldwide, like the best league in the world, the most watched league it in is. the world, I mean, do you, you must be proud of that. Yeah, great. I remember being interviewed at the time and I, I used this phrase. I said, um, well, we have an aeroplane on the runway. We don't know how high it's going to fly. And it's gone to the stratosphere. It's brilliant. When I, mm. And, you know, I do my talks in schools and prisons these days on a voluntary basis going around. And I have a whole presentation about how the development of football over the years and in particular how what's happened with the with the Premier League and how it's gone. And it's such I'm so proud of it all the way it has developed. And you're right. It, it, I call it the fastest train on the track. No, brilliant. The Premier League. Listen. Thank you very much. It's the, the product that we, we, we all adore right now. And the other thing that we have to be very thankful for, um, as Arsenal fans to you for, is bringing us Arsene Wenger. Now, <clears throat> again, an incredible story. Um, first of all, how you met Arsene Wenger. Um, that, that I found was incredible um, in the book as well. Just yeah. a chance meeting. It was. It was on the 1st of January 1989. We were playing Spurs that day and Arsene was just passing through London and he'd asked his agent to fix him up to go to a game. And of all the games, ha luckily happened to choose going to Arsenal. And these were the days when the women were not allowed in the boardroom. So my wife happened to be in what we called the cocktail lounge. The cocktail, you may remember, mm. the old Highbury was the overflow yep. to the boardroom where you had coaches and managers from other other clubs would be in there and guests of the board would go into the cocktail lounge. And um, Arson was in there. My wife was with a friend and um, uh, actually smoked. So Arson asked her for a light. He used to smoke in the casual, he was a casual smoker in those. So he asked my wife's friend for a, a light. And uh, then they got talking. And then I, was, I came in to see how things were going in the cocktail lounge. And I got introduced to Arson. And uh, I said to him, um, how long are you in for? He said, just overnight, just passing through. I'm, I've just come from Istanbul to, from a game. I'm just seeing today's game. And then I'm going back tomorrow to Monaco because he was manager at Monaco mm. at the time. So I, and he was doing quite well in Monaco. So I said, well, what are you doing this evening? He said, nothing. 
I said, well, my wife and I, we're going to a friend's house for dinner. Would you like to come with us? His next answer changed all our lives. He mm. said, I'd love to. And then we went for dinner. And that was a famous Sherard story, which is in the yeah. book. And uh, because my friend happened to be in, in show business, we played charades at the end mm. of the evening. You know, is it a book? Is it a film? Is it, mm. is it a play? And uh, the next thing I'm seeing is arson acting out A Midsummer Night's Dream. <laughs> so I'm thinking this guy is a bit, a bit unusual. So then every time we went to Monaco, I would see how he didn't realize he was auditioning because I could see how he interacted with the players, with the board, with the press. And I could see he was rather special. He was a guy who had a degree in economics, went to university, studied uh, medicine, understand the physiology of players and their muscle content and everything. And I thought, well, this guy's rather unusual. Mm. And then I really, that night, I remember Robbie having a, 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 and I'm not a spiritual guy, but I thought Arsene for Arsenal. It's destiny. <laughs> it, it has to happen one yeah. day. And don't forget, we were happy with George. We were about to win that. We didn't know it mm. in January. We were going to win the league in a sensational style. And I thought, this is going to happen one day. And I kept in touch with him all the time. And um, even when he, obviously, because we had a full cell, we should have employed him soon after George. But I kept in touch with him and uh, sending him the old video, the Philips videotape. You know, they're like bricks, do you remember? Yeah, the, I remember those. Like yeah. the cassettes. <laughs> I would keep sending him after every game so we could look at them to keep in touch. Yeah. And, and, and then, you, listen, you, you, you eventually bring him in yeah. from Grandpa say in Japan. I remember at the time the newspaper headlines, Arsenal, yeah. everybody thinking, Who's, what, what, you know, e even some of the fans were like, what are we doing? You know what I mean? It's, how are we bringing in a guy from Japan? You know? <laughs> <laughs> that was well, what people were saying at the time, but... Well, that was, but it, there was actually a full start. You know, I did propose Arsene when we were losing George. When, we were, when George was leaving in mm. 1994, I proposed that we should take on Arsene. And the board declined the idea. They thought, no, we should get an, an English person, somebody understood the lower leagues, and we went for Bruce Rioch at the time. And then when that when he didn't work out, luckily I was still in touch with Arsene, who by which time had taken himself off, which was a huge gamble for him, taking himself out of the mainstream of Western European football, going to Japan. And a success, he took a team which was virtually bottom of the league, and they won the Emperor's Cup, and they were moving up really well. But I was still in touch with him. And then I rang him, I said, look, we've uh, I know we didn't make it the first time round, Arsen, but you know the club we'd like very much like to to talk to you again. Mm. And uh, obviously, I teed him up so that when he came over, when we were discussing how, what, what we should do about employing him, and then I got the board to agree, and then we went out to Japan to do the deal with Grand Eight. Yeah, and, and it, it, listen, you you look like an absolute genius now, well, right? But. How much was the pressure at that time? Oh, enormous! Right, because he come in and he hit the ground running, which was great. Well, nobody but knew him. Well, that was a great. Yeah. That was a great, great part. So I went to the training ground, London Colney, in the morning that we were going to announce him, and of course it was kept under wraps. Nobody knew who it was, and I said to the players, I said, "We're announcing our new manager this morning," and they said, "Who is it?" I said, "It's Arsene Wenger," and Ray Parler said, "Who the fuck is that?" <laughs> Oh. <laughs> so I said, I said, he's a good guy, give him a chance. And they did, and he changed changed the way we operate. He changed everything, he, he the, the players he brought yeah. in, like Vieira, you speak about Vieira, you speak about, there's one section actually of the book, and again, I'm trying not to spoil it for everybody, but there's one section of the book where you literally go through every invincible player and talk about their qualities. And, yeah, and they were special. You, you speak about in the book how you looked upon them as children. your children. It's true. Well, the fact that the majority of them came to the last Monday, came to the launch of the book, that says a lot. Mm. And on top of that, we had Davos Suka, Lee Dixon, um, Anders Limpa, I mean, Paul Davis. You know, we had a lot of players there. Yeah, that's the respect they got for you for, well, that's for, very for kind. what you did um, at the club. And Robbie, in life, you can only give it your best shot, can't you? You've given it, you've done well, <laughs> right? And, and with that, with the um, bringing in Arsene Wenger, the players are signed, the success followed, and you speak about in the book the invincible season um, and how incredible that was. And I mean, what was that like, you know, going a whole season unbeaten? It, it was very special. Um, 
and there was some there was a bonding between them and I, I felt this again on Monday night I keep talking about that not just because of the respect they had for Arsene and perhaps for me but the bonding they have amongst themselves they were strong Every player was a man, strong, determined. They had a wonderful feeling between them, which was great. So it, this story is in the, uh, it was at the 2014 World Cup in Brazil. And Arsene and I hosted our, old, our former Brazilian players. We had Gilberto Silva, we had Edu and Silvino. We had mm. them all for dinner one evening. And I happened to be sitting next to Gilberto, and I said to him, Gilberto, I've never asked any of the Invincibles this, but can you give me a story about the Invincibles? And he thought for a moment, he's very pensive, Gilberto. Have you ever interviewed him? He's just a, such a lovely guy. And he said, yes, Mr. Dean. He said, here's a story I can tell you. So he stood up. I don't know whether you can, I'm gonna stand up here. <laughs> so he said, just we were in the tunnel and just before we were going out we'd be in the tunnel and just before we we're going out patrick vieira would turn around to jens Lehmann and give him a nod jens would turn around to loren give him a nod it would go to soul who would give him a nod it would go to thierry and to dennis and to freddie it would go and that nod would be almost choreographed going down the line of the players and the nod was we're going to do it today and then collectively, they would look across to the opposition standing there in the tunnel, and they could sense fear in the eyes of the opposition. They knew they'd given themselves strength to win the game. And that, that sent shivers down me when I heard that story. Wow, that's incredible. Especially after, you know, at the weekend, I don't know if you saw the, the, the Wolves goalkeeper turning around to De Bruyne and saying, oh, can you go easy on us? I mean, you know, the mentality, <laughs> the mentality of that compared to yeah. that, you know. But no, the, the mentality of that team was absolutely incredible and all the things they achieved and Arsene Wenger, what he did. And the thing that I found really fascinating in the book is that when a lot of this success was going on, you still had, and you, you said in the book, this is the first time you're talking about it, you had been swindled out of a lot of money in your personal business by um, a, an individual. And you was going through all these legal battles and that yeah. whilst that was all happening. Well, no, I that mean, was before. That was yeah. in the 80s, Rob. Yeah. Actually, no, chronology was okay. that. That happened in my, my sugar business time. Yeah. That was in the 80s. And that was a big setback because I just joined the board. Everything was going well. And then all of a sudden I got hit with a truck right like that. And I'd never spoken about it for the best part of 40 years. But when I was going to write the book, my ghostwriters, Amy Lawrence, who was they're both fantastic, Amy mm -hmm. Lawrence, who you know, obviously, yep. and Henry Winter from The Times, they were fantastic. Mm -hmm. They said, look, let's let get some ground rules here. If you're gonna write a book, you've gotta tell your whole story. Don't hold back. I said, well, that's it. Well, everything there is, you've gotta let it come out. Otherwise, it's not a proper autobiography. Mm -hmm. You know, because like leaving Arsenal, I'd kept that to myself for 15 years. The story, the fraud story was nearly 40 years. It was in the 1980s and I hadn't mentioned it to anybody. That must have been like a that really, was tough, really time. tough time. That was really hard, uh, but I had to get through it. And you had to be still doing all the business at Arsenal. And yeah, and it was worrying, but I managed to get, you know, get through it. Yeah. And I always tell this to youngsters, you know, when, when you, 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 you will be determined on how you come through adversity. Yeah. You know, if you ever, everybody, whoever you speak to have had some reversals in their life Definitely. and it's how you pick yourself up from a reversal. How do you mm. get on? And that was, it was, I was determined to make sure that I was gonna be a success. And my late mother always used to say to me, shoot for the moon, even if you miss, you land amongst the stars. 100%. And I would always think about that. Yeah, and, and then of course, you know, you speak about in the book, right at the start of the book, you kind of begin with it, you know, you leave in Arsenal, which even yeah. just, you know, it's emotional, just like, and for me as an Arsenal fan who at the time, I was like, how the hell are we getting rid of David Dean? Are, are they crazy? What's going on? What's, what's happened? But, you know, again, there was a lot of things that were going on behind the scenes that us fans didn't understand. Yeah, it was difficult. It mm. was a difficult time. The last year of my tenure at Arsenal was not pleasant. And it was 
bubbling up. You could see things weren't going well. And it was really all about the financing, the stadium. And I, wa I wanted to see, the, and I could see the game was going globally. We needed to have a muscular partner. And uh, so it, that was a very difficult time for me. Must have been because, you know, the, all these guys on the board were your friends. They, 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 yeah. These were people that you, you, you know, you were working with all the time. And you, you, uh... I had a great relationship with all of them. Mm. Uh, we, you know, we, we, yeah, we got on well. And then all of a sudden it started going, going wrong. Mm. In hindsight, would you have approached it? And I don't want to, I want people to read it, so I'm not even going into details of it. Would you have approached it differently? You know, we're all clever with hindsight, Robbie. Um, could I have done so? Maybe. But I was only ever acting in the best interest of the club. I wanted to make sure the club had the most solid foundation that it could, that it could challenge the best. Don't forget, these are the days when we had Roman Abramovich who came in, splashing the cash at Chelsea, then latterly, then we had Man City coming in. You know, I could see the way the game was going. You know, when I started in 1983, it was a local businessman like myself who bought into a football club. Then it became millionaires. Then after that, it became billionaires. And then it became sovereign states. It became offshoots, right, subsidiaries or companies involved with the, with the country involved who were actually getting involved in football clubs, as you can see recently with Newcastle, Newcastle yeah. you know, and uh, the Saudi Association there. Mm. So I didn't want to ask them to be left behind. We needed to have a, a good dancing partner. Mm. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, that led to, well, to you yeah, leaving. This oh. often happens, you know, there is friction sometimes. Yeah. The interesting thing, and I learned it for the first time when I went to that brilliant event that you, and we'll get to that later on, that you, you hosted with Arsene Wenger, um, the, the twinning project. For the, for the twinning project. And that was sort of the first time I heard that Arsene Wenger actually said that he also was going to leave the club. He, like When he heard that you were no longer at the Arsenal, he was like, well, I'm leaving as well. And you, and this is how much, you know, I, I'm very grateful for this. And it shows me how much you love Arsenal, that you said to him, no, don't leave Arsenal because you're needed. Yeah, that's true. I remember that very well. When I left, it was the 18th of April, 2007. 5 p.m. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and uh, he came around that evening, came straight from the training ground, and we had a chat, and he said, I have to leave as well, David. You know, you brought me to the club. I'm going to have to leave. I said, no, Arsene. I thought about it. And I said, Arsene, the club needs you. You've got to stay. And I said, I'm an, I'm an Arsenal man. I, you respect of what's happened to me. The club needs you. Yep, yeah, and then, listen... It then follows quite tougher times for Arsenal. Well, after all the success that we've had, with you being so involved in that, you leave the club now and we move to the new stadium and all of a sudden, you know, the, the, you know, the purse strings are, are tied. We're not signing players. We're, we're not signing players, or should I say, of the quality we used to sign. We're, yeah. we're no longer um, able to hang on to the players that, you know, like Vieira and that, and we start to see a decline. And as you said, at the same time, the rise of your Chelsea's and, and yeah. those sort of clubs. And Arsene Wenger starting to come under a lot of pressure from the fans. Um, how did you feel in that period? You know, I mean, you're, you're very friendly with him. You know, you're, you, 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 you yeah. yourself at that time were saying that you felt there more investments needed. We need to go out and get a billionaire. Did, how was he feeling? Uh, it wasn't comfortable for him. In fact, he admitted it on the on Monday night. He said at the end of that season, he had what, what he called virtually a, a burnout, he called it, because uh, he was finding it very difficult because money was tight. All the money really was going towards something. We shipped on a lot of debt. We were talking about building a new stadium and it was we were going to take on something like 450 million of debt which we didn't have. So we had to take money up from, from the Emirates and from Nike, uh, from our major sponsors, which drained us for future years, because you can only take the money once. Mm. And so it was a very difficult time for the club, balancing the books. And, and it took some time before we actually got the finance for the stadium. That was stressful. But we managed to get that through. But, you know, Arsene was, was 
I mean, the fact that he managed to get the club for 20 successive years in the Champions League was quite remarkable on a very, very thin budget, which he yeah. did. Yeah. And, um, you know, what was it like for you, you know, seeing how it ended for Arsene for Wenger Arsene, after well, that, all the great things he'd done for the club? And he started to get towards towards the end. And listen, I, I it, me being here on AFTV and... Arsene Wenger being someone that I absolutely adored and brought me the best moments ever as an Arsenal fan. Towards the end, as me, as a person who used to interview lots of fans, I saw it sort of building. It was sort of, yeah. over a period of time, it was starting to, the, the, you, first of all, in the, I, I, I'd describe it as say, earlier on, most people were like, they're so loyal. They're like, we, we can't, we refuse to say anything bad about Arsene Wenger because we're so loyal. But as things results and then as I said the rise of some of our you know our competitors around us you start to see fans saying well actually you know I think it might be time for him to leave and then all of a sudden he's gone and yeah and that was that was tough for him and I remember I think it was at Stoke when there was a plane in the oh, sky yeah, I remember that. and there was a banner at the back of the plane saying Wenger out and that really mm. hurt put up by an Arsenal fan you know mm. that really hurt him and he still talks about that to this day. You know, he'd, he'd given 22 years to the club and uh, for him to leave was not easy to be virtually forced out. Mm. But your book kind of gives a more perspective on it for me, even for me as a fan, because a lot of fans used to say at the time, why doesn't Arsene just come out and explain what he's having to, because we could realise that there's got to be something. Why are we not buying that player? We know what we need. We, why don't we buy this player and that player? Why doesn't he come out and tell us? But is it because he's just such a loyal yes. person to the people yes, he worked sir. for that he was just like, I will take it on behalf of everybody else? He is very loyal, extremely loyal, loyal to a fault. He's a man of tremendous integrity and... Um, totally dedicated. I mean, he was dedicated to the club. And that's why I always felt, and I've said this publicly time and again, that I felt that he should have had a role, an ongoing role, even if it wasn't to be the manager or coach, as you call it today, that he should have had a role within the club. Because his knowledge, he's got an encyclopedian knowledge of players from around the world. So I was saying, well, he's not good enough for Arsenal, but he is good enough to be for FIFA to be the head of global football development for 211 countries. That intelligence, that knowledge, that experience had to be harnessed within Arsenal Football Club. And I compare it to what's happened at Man City, when you can see they've got 11 satellite clubs around the world now, four of whom actually won their league, their title last year. So they've taken the game to another level, Man City. You know, and I could think that maybe that should have been Arsene's role to develop the club globally. Um, but it didn't happen, unfortunately, and he left. And, of course, uh, he got the job at FIFA, where, and he is now very settled. I said to him the other day, what's your ambition? What's your goal at FIFA? He said two things. One, I want to make sure there's more boys and girls playing the game. And two, I want to have better coaches coaching them. He said, that's my ambition. That's what I'm doing. And, and um, also... A statue? Do you think it should be a statue? I do, of, of... of course. What he delivered to the club, I mean, it's phenomenal. You know, quite apart from the Invincibles, but the trophies, the style of play. And he did it in style, he did it with integrity. And uh, I, I think there should be a statue. I think for it should be a statue of you as well. Well, that's kind of you to say that. You can say that. But... <laughs> <laughs> I do think there should be a statue of you. Thank you very much. It's very kind. <laughs> there should. There should be a statue of you. And do you know the other thing, David, right? You just touched on that as well. Another thing that you did, or again, you spoke about the women's yeah. um, football. The Arsenal um, women's team, which you, along with Vic Akers, you know, he brought the idea yeah, to yeah. you. he brought the idea. And you was right behind it from the beginning. And we were one of the first clubs to, we to, to have an all-conquering women's team. And to this day, yeah. that legacy remains that we've got such a great... I mean... Leah Williamson, yeah, the captain oh, of yeah. England, lifting up the the Euros, yeah, and, right. an Arsenal girl since she what seventeen years at the club. Correct. That wouldn't be if yeah. I get get that statue ready, right? Because that wouldn't be if you hadn't have got right behind the women's team. That's kind of you to say that, Robbie. 
And it really, Vic Akers, who was the kit man at the time for the men's team, it was really his idea. And he came to me and he said, look, I've got some of the girls who like to play football. Do you think we can get an Arsenal women's team going? So I went to the board and I said, look, we're going to have to fund this because they're going to need to have their expenses paid. We've got to have coaching. We've got to give them some space at the training ground or somewhere to train. And I remember thinking that they said, well, how much is it going to cost? I said, well, I think a budget for the whole season will be something like £200,000. And I remember one of the board members said, is this a publicity stunt? I said, no. I go to the States a lot. I can see what's going on in America with women's football. We want to be the first. We want to pioneer yeah, he's it. Looking ahead. Again, he's looking and ahead. we've got to, to do it. And Vic, to his great credit, uh, he really took on the, the mantle, the, the job of being, being their coach. And of course, then we were winning trophies one after the other. And after that, we had to get other clubs to join. We couldn't just have one club in the league. We had to get everybody mm. else going. That was another uh, uh, struggle to get everybody to come on, on board there. But, but we managed it. So and, and, and it's how, gone from how, how great strength. was it to see the women's final? Well, Euros. absolutely. When you go to the women's final and you can see there was 87,000 people at Wembley and it was covered by BBC One on national television, Robbie. That says so much with, about the with, women's with game. With amazing viewing figures. And yes, and you can see the way the team's going now. It's really mm. great. And, to, and like you said, uh, Beth Mead... Leah, two of the stars of the team, yeah. Arsenal players. And Alex Scott, who was actually hosting Legend. our RE yep. evening, right? She's done so well for herself. Mm. No, no, no. It's been, it's been absolutely awesome what, what you, you did with that. And what, what I like about you is always your foresight. You're always looking ahead. You're always, you know, you're, you're an innovator. You know what I mean? You, wow. you, you don't stand still. Thank you for saying that. I've always tried my best. And when I was also, obviously, the FA... Uh, I was the FA Vice Chairman. I wanted to see the England team do well. I'm patriotic about the country. And uh, obviously we had to choose various managers there for England over my time, which we did. It's a chapter in the book about Sven. Yep, and you took a lot, again, you took a lot of flack yeah, because you brought in manager, yeah. a foreign manager and you got a lot of kickback for that. But again, he was pretty successful in... in he, he was indeed. Yeah. In fact, when he started, I think, the England in the FIFA world ranking, England was 17th. When he left, we were fourth. So he didn't have a bad career where, yeah. as England coach. And um, so, you know, getting the uh, that off the ground. So um, now I've had a fascinating career. Obviously, it's all chronicled in the book, mm. which I'm, I have to say I'm proud. It was just over a year's work. No, it's exceptional. In, into it, and I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Do you know what I love as well, right? It's like, towards the end, you speak about what you're doing now, which is um, you do a lot of charitable work, and you go into, you started this um, thing where you started to go into prisons. Yeah. And you started this charity where you you twin, well, explain it to us, how you t okay. the twinning charity. Uh, well, I'll tell you the story right from the onset. The, the genesis of it is that um, when I left Arsenal, I had a bit of time on my hands and <laughs> I, I, I was invited to, to lunch by, you may know him, a guy called Robert Peston, who is now the, the BBC. He, he was the BBC business mm. correspondent. He's now actually with ITV, but he was the BBC business mm. correspondent. You're quite right. He invited me for lunch, which I think, in fact, I paid for in the end. But at any rate, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so he said, I'm starting a charity. I said, what is it, Robert? He said, speakers for schools. And he's an Arsenal fan. He said, um, what I'm doing, he said, I, I've got a lot of successful people that I've met being the BBC business correspondent. And he said, if I could get some of the business people that I know to go into schools, to secondary schools, to state schools, age group 15 to 17 or 18, where youngsters are on the cusp of making a decision. Do they take an apprenticeship? Do they go to university? Do they take a job? Maybe they can be influenced. I said, I'd be happy to do it. I said, Robert, count me in. Before lockdown, I've been to 550 schools around the country, all over the country. So one morning, I always get my best idea shaving, and I'm shaving one morning, <laughs> and I'm thinking, where else is there a captive audience? I'm enjoying this giving talks about, uh, uh, about my career and what I've achieved, and I like to think it's motivational. I like to think mm. it's inspirational. So I thought, prisons, what about going into prisons? So then I knocked on the door of a friend of mine at the home office. I said, look, I'm doing these talks in schools. What about doing them in prison? They said, well, we've never had that before, but um, let me think about it. 
It took them about eight months before I got my first prison, HMP Rochester in Kent. And then I went there and there's three supervisors with clipboards and they're checking my homework sort of thing. So, so at the end of it all, they, they said, um, this is funny because I've given talks all around the world for FIFA, UEFA, the FA, <laughs> Arsenal, G14. And they said, we quite like what you're doing. We've got 113 prisons. Would you like to go around them doing the same? I said, sure. So I had a bit of time. So if I was going to Leeds School, I'd do Leeds Prison at the same time. Mm. I'd do a double header. And that's what I was doing. And I went round to every single prison in the country wow. and, and women's and young offenders prisons as well. So going around, I'm thinking, what is football doing in prisons? Virtually nothing, apart from one or two clubs. Funny enough, Arsenal had a tenuous relationship with Pentonville. Mm. And then I thought, what about doing something properly in prisons, doing something structured where the football club or their charitable arm would actually put coaches into prisons to try and teach the offenders a skill which they don't know already with a hope of getting a job when they come out. Because the statistic is, which is scary, that 83% of the offenders when they come out of prison cannot get a job. If they can't get a job, what happens? Back to drugs, back to reoffending. And 64% within the first year come back inside again. So I want to try and arrest that. I want to try and change that statistic. So by giving them an opportunity, and who doesn't like football, right, it took off immediately. And it's called the Twinning Project. We provide the offenders with kit properly. They've got coaches, professional coaches coming in. It's an FA accredited certificate they get at the end of their course. And we're now finding they're getting jobs at the end of it, which is Fantastic. so important. It's so rewarding. It's one of the most satisfying projects I've ever done in my life. And, and that event that you did, which I was very lucky to go to at the, at Palladium, the Palladium, which, uh, you know, and again, it's in the book, you, you speak a lot about how your love of the theatre. So it's great that you was actually on the stage. And um, by the way, that event was one of the best oh, thank you. football events I've ever been to with you and Arsene Wenger on stage. But that was all to raise money for the It was project, to raise it? money. It was it's a charity and it was to raise money, which it did, for the uh, for the 20 Project charity. It was very successful and I must say, Arsene gave up his time free of charge and it was it was really, it was, well, I'm glad you enjoyed it because it was something people hadn't heard before. It was fantastic. Uh, that, that was, a, a, and, and reading about it in the book, uh, how you put it together and everything. I was just proud that I was able to be there. <clears throat> um, what do you think of the team at the moment? You know, um, because the, the one thing, uh, 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 again, which I found fascinating is that somebody with your knowledge, you started the Premier League, you know, you must have had loads of clubs come after you and say, David, come and take over here. But you never did. You've always said, no, I'm an Arsenal man. Yeah. You're Arsenal through and through. What do you think of the club at the moment? Well, firstly, I've still retained my four club seats, my 10 season tickets, which I give away to school teachers and to prison officers. But I, right. I use my club seats, so I'm virtually there every, every home game. Um, and, it, you know, you see them from my diary. I mean, mm. there's an old saying, you can take the boy out of Brooklyn, but you can't take Brooklyn out of the boy. Mm. And so, I, obviously, I still, I still I want to see the team doing well. And there is a renaissance going on, there's no doubt. Mm. It is really looking exciting at the moment. And, you know, long may it last. Stop, stop the race. We want to finish where we are at the moment. <laughs> That'd be great. That'd be great. Um, what do you think, you know, like somebody like an Edu, for instance, who you signed. Yes. Now doing the job that you used to do. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Great. You know, I'm delighted for him and I hope they mm. keep it up. And they've, they've, got, they've made some good signings in this last window. So it's looking very promising. Do you ever want to get back in? Do you ever? Sorry? They gave you a call and they said, David, come on, we want well, you. you know, I've always been there to try and assist if ever that needed. Um, you know, and uh, obviously I've got other things in my life now. The Twinning Project's great. The and all these project. things you do. But for me, with your knowledge and that, what? come on, Arsenal, just give this guy a call. So consultancy, some sort of consultancy role at least? I mean... Uh, I can't, I can't. Talk your about knowledge that. of football around the world... Yeah. Would you take it if they called you? I don't know. I, you know, um, they've moved on, I've moved on, and I think that's where it is. And the same, same with Arsene. You know, we were a team together and a successful team. And I think, you know, that, that breakup hurt because we, we had unfinished business.
at the time. Do you think we, 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 we got rid of him too early? Arsenal well, that's what I said before. I, I, if they didn't want him as, as manager or coach, then there should have been another position found for him to keep him within, within the club somewhere. And I felt that perhaps was unfortunate. And but now he's gone on to other things and he's very yep. happy with what he's doing. So he's the head of global football development for the world. You know, last week he was in Guatemala, Nicaragua, Panama, right, teaching young coaches, putting his, his influence with them, his methods. You know, he's, he's, a, he's, a great, he's a great thinker. It does seem strange that you two are not even in some sort of ambassadorial role for Arsenal. Because even when I go around the world at Arsenal, I've been lucky enough to go around the world everywhere. Everyone knows you two. Every Arsenal fan knows you two. So, well, you know, there, there was that wonderful story when he first joined. So he joined in October 1996, and his first full season, we won the double. We won the Premier League, and we won the FA Cup. And then soon after that, we had a pre-season game in Amsterdam. We were playing Ajax pre-season, and when Arsene arrived there at the hotel, he was mobbed. So as we were coming into the hotel, all the press and the fans were around him. I said, I said, don't worry, I'll check you in. So I went over to the reception desk and the guy gave me a piece of paper to sign Arsene in and it said name, I put Arsene Wenger. Then it put address, I put care of Arsenal Football Club. <laughs> and it put occupation, I put miracle worker. And he was a miracle worker. You know, I can't go, I know I could talk to you all day about the Sol Campbell thing. How did you pull that off? How did you manage to get Tottenham's arm captain, sorry, away from them with them not even knowing, right under their nose? I mean, how did you pull well, it off? It, it, the details are all in the book, but I'll just cut it short and saying that by saying, obviously, it was probably one of the, the trickiest transfers we've ever done. Uh, why? Because it was from Spurs, which made it difficult but he was at the end of his contract and it took a lot of persuasion and convincing and Arsene and I would walk around my house in Todridge walk around the garden at midnight because he was paranoid that we we're gonna get busted by the paparazzi and um, but we didn't we managed to uh, to avoid the, the press luckily and we um, we signed him but the whole, the whole story is in the it's book it's in the book listen if you want to know how they you know he's like a um something out of the CIA or, or MI5, right? how they pulled it off, right? But if you want to know how they do that, you've got to get this book. This book is absolutely brilliant. And, and I highly recommend um, the audio book because you get to listen to David's voice. Um, he did the audio book. Um, so I, I know in listening to a lot of audio books, a lot of times the, the authors get people to do it for them, but you did it yourself, which was a bonus for me, just listening to your voice, explaining everything. Well, I insisted when the publishers said, do you want an actor to read the book for you, for your recorded version? I said, no, no, it, I want it. it's got to have my passion, my feeling into it, my emphasis. So I insisted and I had to go into a studio for four days for about six hours every day. It's harder than you think, by mm. the way, reading your own book. <laughs> And, you know, you've got to go over bits time and time again to get it right. And Arson very kindly volunteered to read, which he did, the forward, it's a brilliant which forward he recorded well. in his office at FIFA in Zurich a few months ago. So he was very kind to do that. And, um, yeah, so I'm glad you appreciated well, it, this, Robbie. This book is a must. If, you, if you're into football, whether you're an Arsenal fan or whether you're just a football fan, as I explained right at the start, this book for me is an absolute must. This is like a a history lesson as well as, and it's entertaining as well. Um, he's a very funny guy, right? You listen to some of his little one-liners. Where can we get this book? You can get it on Amazon. Uh, that's the, right there, or perhaps Waterstones, but... Uh, also shop? Um, uh, I'm sad to say it's not in the Arsenal shop. How, how come? It's not in the Arsenal shop? It's not in the Arsenal shop. And that disappoints me terribly. Oh, come on, Arsenal. What, how can it not be in the Arsenal shop? This is part of Arsenal's history. It's very delicate to answer that, Robbie. But all I would say is because the publishers tried to put it in. And um, I heard that the, um, 
the media department wanted to protect the owners, which I think was oh, come on. was unfortunate. That's ridiculous. This book should be in the Arsenal shop. All of this that's in here is part of Arsenal's history and a fond, I, I think, you know, a fond part of our history. And, you know, I, 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 no, no, I find that a bit rude. That's disappointing me a lot. Um, and, well, listen, and, and me terribly. Yeah, this should be in the Arsenal shop. So come on, Arsenal, get this in the shop. This needs to be in the shop. And every fan out there, you need to get this book. Um, the link we're going to put in the description where you can click onto that and go to Amazon and purchase the book. I recommend this. This as well with Christmas coming up will be a great Christmas present as well. And um, David, I really want to thank you. I, I, I don't want to just thank you for coming in here today and for the book. I want to thank you for your service to Arsenal Football Club and for everything that you've done um, for Arsenal Football Club and for football in this country because I, I think you're a, a truly inspirational um, person. You know, I, I read this and it wasn't just the Arsenal stuff in it. It inspired me. Like even when you spoke about the stuff you, you do in prisons at schools, I, I go and talk in schools as well. Yeah. And, and after, after reading... I was like, maybe I should go and do some things in some prisons as well. well um, come with me. Like, You're very welcome. I would love to. And what's more, Robbie, I'll get you out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, David Dean. An absolute, this is a legend in here. And make sure you get the book. Oh, well done. Thank you very much. Calling the Shots by David Dean. How to Win in Football and Life is available right now on Amazon. All proceeds of David Dean's book will be donated to The Twinning Project. Click the link in the description to get the book.